have jump start. The problem is, if I am plugging a, a Spark 4M architecture, sometimes, sometimes I86, sometimes 4U architecture, 3U architecture, different, different architectures I am plugging. They are not the same. The machines are not the same. So if I do just regular jump start, it may not be uh, may not be suitable for all the clients. The machines I am plugging in are going to be clients. They don't have operating system. They are depending on the servers to start and then we are going to install in them because they have hard drives. right? But only problem is they are not of the same type. I86, Spark 4M, 4U, 1U, like the different, different architectures. To solve that problem, I will make this installation custom. Custom jump start. I customize that environment in such a way, computer will answer all the questions. Sorry, computer itself will have answers to all the questions. And also, whether it is I86 or any other machine, it will install without asking you, without disturbing you. So I plug 100 machines in the network, then I will say, use a command you will learn later, boot, net, install. Then you will go to the network, and then it will start installing in all the 100 machines. So I go and have my lunch and come back. It's all ready. Okay? All the answers, all the answers for questions are done automatically. So that type of environment is custom jumpstart. Okay? So I have to decide. Uh, maybe I have another problem. My server is always used. I know if I install Solaris, or if I install Solaris, I have to shut down the server and reboot after the installation is done. Right? And also the server should be free. I can't install so another version of Solaris if I'm using Solaris 9. I want to use, install Solaris 10. I can't install it in, at a time when people are using it. Can they do that? Cannot. But here there is a solution for that. Right? So while people are using, I can install Solaris there. I'm having Solaris 9, I install Solaris 10. Right? So that is called live. Live install. When the survey is running, I'm doing. Then we say my my uh, my uh, Installation failed. My installation, what I did now, failed. So what will happen now? The system will crash? It's useless now? No, because when you realize you have another copy. Yeah, it will, it, it will revert back to the old one. It will revert don't back you have to the old copies, one. Uh, don't, don't you have two copies? One to, uh, in which you update and then you start installing. You update the, uh, the copy. Okay. And then you update the copy with the current version, and then you make the whatever update you are making, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will work something like that. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. So it will it will update at the same time. Yeah. It may copy somewhere some information, okay. and then it will it will upgrade. If things go 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 wrong, it will revert back to the old one. Yeah. If things go go good, if things go good, the new one will okay. take over. Then at that time you have to reboot. You have to reboot. Finally, right? So only for a short time, maybe have, maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you may have a break, interruption. Right? So that also we have an option. Right? So we have interactive, we have different type of insulation, which will some insulation occupy big space, some insulation occupy small space in the hard drive. We can install over the network, right? We can install from CD-ROM, from flash image, from USB, tape drive, right? All facilities are there. So these are the things we will do when we do the installation. After we install, then we have to allow users to log in. Otherwise, what is the point? Right? You install an operating system. We don't set up users. Right? So we learn how to set up users. Then we have to copy data, restore. So we have to learn how to restore data. We would have copied from an old machine, and we are going to restore here. So we should know how to restore, right? So set up users, restores, 
okay and when we restore people people have to access access in access this information so we had to have file system permission people have to have file system permission right so they can't access everything in the system and for that people to use i have to mount this mount the file systems in 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 their workstations or in their computers if i am using a workstation or computer or pc i have to mount what data directly from the server into my right that has to be done we connect to server and Into the we have to share it there. NFS. Share it. When it share, it becomes like an NFS share. Right. Then we come and mount here. And only problem is mount can be done by only root. Only root uh, root can mount that. So I don't want that because every time uh, there are thousands of people working, they can't call root to mount file systems every time. So I have to know how to automatically mount when the system starts, right? When my system starts. So I have to learn what is auto FS. I learn what is auto FS, right? And also, I have I am working on the data here. My my main component here is data, right? I want to centralize data. That's why I have a server file server where I put all my data. A home directory server where I put all my home directories. Okay. So now I have to preserve this data. How can I preserve the data? What are the methods to preserve, maintain, or secure your data? First thing is, if I want a copy of that, then I have to know how to back up. That is just to take a copy of that. Then what about how to how to protect that from intruders? You have to. Intruders, or you watch intruders, or monitor intruders, monitor user usage, user use, user user access. You have to monitor user access. Who are the people monitor using the system? Who are the people opening the files here? You have to monitor that. So we will learn how to do that also, right? I can have firewall. Yeah, firewall. Set up firewall. All those has to be done, right? And I have to access this server from outside the company also. So I have to set up environment port forwarding in your router. Right, right. You have to know little network in that, right? And then port forward all the requests to this server or that server, depending on where they have to go, right? So I have to know about ports. I have to know about ports, right? And in an environment, I have server, and then the other people are accessing the server. They may access the server by telnet. They may access the server by by R login. They may access by SSH. But I don't want telnet. I don't want R login. How I can control, right? So controlling user requests by telnet uh, SSH. R login, etc. How I can do that, right? You also understand here what is RCP, Remote Procedure Call. You understand what is INET. There is a daemon called INET. Understand, right? So all those things are going to be covered. INET daemon, you heard about that in AX. What does INET daemon do? It starts the services which are not started, 
during the boot up provided in that version of IAX if it is in the i-native.conf file enabled in i-native.conf file but here in Solaris 10 i-native.conf file is not controlling i daemon so there is another facility here so we have to talk about that facility SMF we have to talk about SMF service management facility how I can start a service how I can stop a service right how I, how I can restart the service refresh the service right so I have to know fMRI also because every service has an fMRI fault management resource identifier fault management resource identifier every service in the case of Solaris 9, we were using like something like LP. LP is a, is a service. LP start. Right? Here we can't, we may not be able to say like that. Here we have to say at least part of the fMRI and say start. So we are saying SVC Adam and the fMRI start like that. Okay? Or stop. So we have to know about SMF. What is SMF? Right? Service management facilities. And these service management facilities create a database. Like in uh, AX, you learn about ODM, ODM mm -hmm. creates a database. So here SMF creates a database. Those da that database is in ETC directory. There are directories involved in, in this ETC, SVC, right? VAR SVC, USR, LIB, SVC. Like that, some directories we have to know, right? To find out, right? Don't worry about the last one. I may mean, not remember that. R S V C, C S V C, user lib S V C. I think, right? So we have to talk about this S M F. How can I create my own service? How can I run it? That idea also we will get from here. What is the advantage of using S M F? Before S M F, what were we using? We were using run levels. Right? We were starting services using run levels, but we have to know run levels also. Right? SMF may be something like upstart in the latest version of Red Hat. They, they replace run level, replacing run level with upstart. So also run level we have to know because in your environment you may have older versions of Solaris. I don't have to update my Solaris machine. It's running fine, right? Why should I upgrade? So I'm using Solaris 9. Solaris 9 doesn't have SMF, right? So there we have to use run levels. During the boot up, it goes to that phase called init phase. You, you know init, in AX you learned about init. In init phase, it selects the run level, okay? So we'll talk about that also. Since all the data are saved in your in your server, your file server, your data is in your file server, right? So I, I like to know what type of file system I should create there based on my purpose, right? Uh, and when I create a file system, how much frame size should be, frame size or how much the frame fragmenting should be, all those I have to decide. So we'll talk about those also. If suppose your file system get corrupt, corrupted, how to salvage that <coughs> from the backup super block all those we will learn right then we also learn about file system types and ZFS also we will talk about both UFS and ZFS the difference between UFS and ZFS why we should use ZFS right mm -hmm. it has <coughs> built in built in volume management right it has self healing capability it heals itself right and it can store in in diff, in, in infinite <coughs> size of file system, right? So many trillion zeta bytes. Okay. So those features we will learn how to create schools with that, right? Zero schools, and then how to create file systems. Right? Nowadays, in the later versions of Solaris, the number of commands are coming down. Right? Commands comes with options. Right? So you don't have to remember so many commands. Right? how to create a service file system, 
how to manage that. That's all, right? And suppose you are you are doing something related to configuration, then there is a third command instead of this country. So those things we'll learn. And we talked about how to centralize the data, right? Not only data you have to centralize, many other things you have to centralize. For example, I have a directory etc. In etc, we have a lot of configuration files. Can you tell me some configuration files in etc? And? Password. Password. Groups. Groups then? Not that. I need okay. mail service, mail, mail, related, any file related to controlling mail. services, okay, then. Scale for shell. Profile. IP tables. Maybe some, some, something related to profiles. Cron jobs. Cron jobs. Cron jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Also, we don't central. That is for the server only, right? Uh, which we want, which, like for ETC host file. We want all the systems to have same ETC host file. Don't you think so? ETC password also, I want all the systems to have the same thing. So that I can log in from any system. Right? But how can I create ETC password in each computer? Right? How? Then there is a big work for me. Uh, okay, first time I can copy ETC password from this computer to all the other computers. But it is not very practical. It's not very practical. Uh, so what I do is, I want to centralize all the configuration files, configuration files in one place. Like I am centralizing all the data in one place. So for that we have to talk about name service. So for that we will talk about name service. That is also a very interesting subject, right? In part two we will talk about name service, right? In the name service, we will talk about what is NIS, what is NIS plus, DNS, and LDAP a little. Okay. Different types of name services. Using NIS, I can centralize all the ETC configuration files there in one place. So if I change, I, I had to change only in one place. Same with NIS plus. But DNS is not for that purpose. DNS is for name resolution. If I want to go to internet, DNS. Okay. Okay. So my system can crash any time. Right? If anything goes wrong, maybe I added a new pa patch, or I added a new package, or new new driver. Something went wrong. The system crashed. Then I like to know why system crash. All this time it didn't crash, right? What caused that to crash? Then I have to learn about how to do the dumps, the so dump facility, right? And I where do I want to save my dump? I don't want to save my dump sometimes in the swap. By default, it is saving the swap space. So swap space sometimes may not be enough. So I want to decide where to say, what is my dumb device? What is the pattern of the file? All those I can decide. I want the file to be having the process ID in it. Or I want the file to have the user ID in it. Like that. So when a dumb file is created, the name also I can change. So those things I learn in dumb facility. Right? 